Hey guys, this is Justin. Welcome to the Excess Returns Investing Channel, where we focus on the strategies and tactics that can help you become a better long-term investor. If you're interested in learning about investing, please join us as we learn along with you. Thanks for checking us out. In this episode of Excess Returns, Jack and I talk high-yield debt investing with Rajay Bagaria, CIO of Wasserstein Debt Opportunities and author of High Yield Debt, an insider's guide to the marketplace. We look at the high-yield debt market from the ground up and cover the major players, the types of high-yield debt, and the terms and concepts investors need to understand when looking at the high-yield debt market. The three most important things you will learn in this episode are, one, the fundamentals of high-yield debt investing and the key concepts to understand, two, who the buyers and sellers are in the high-yield debt market, and three, the return profile of high-yield debt and how it compares to other areas of the market and asset classes. Thank you for listening. Please enjoy this discussion with Rajay Bagaria. Just one more thing before we start. For anyone who is new to our channel, I want to thank you for coming and invite you to join the Excess Returns community. Our goal is to build a community of people who want to work together to become better long-term investors. And thanks for the support of our viewers. We have more than doubled our subscribers on YouTube in each of the past two years. We want to do it again this year, so if you find our content valuable, we hope you will join us and subscribe to our channel and like this video to help us continue to grow this community and reach our goal. We appreciate your support. This episode is brought to you by Alpha Architect for Advisors. Whether you're an established firm or just starting out, you know the right systems can be the difference maker to achieving your growth goals. That's why Alpha Architect now offers a suite of turnkey model portfolios that can be customized to fit your practice. Built on Alpha Architect's decades of rigorous academic research, our model portfolios aim to systematize portfolio management so that you can spend less time tinkering with funds and more time finding your next great client. Systemize today to save time tomorrow. That's building with conviction. That's Alpha Architect for advisors. To learn more about Alpha Architect's model portfolios and to schedule a consultation, visit advisors.alphaarchitect.com slash models. That's advisors, A-D-V-I-S-O-R-S dot alphaarchitect.com slash models. Alpha Architect for advisors, built with conviction. Hi, Rajay. Thank you for joining us today. Hi, Justin. Thanks for having me. Jack and I have been looking forward to this conversation with you. Um, our background and experience is more in the public equity market and building systematic strategies. And so, you know, what we like to do is talk to people that are in completely different parts of the market. And you spent your career um, in the world of high yield uh, debt investing. And that's a completely different animal than obviously common stock investing. Um, you actually wrote a book, the title of that book, High Yield Debt, An Insider's Guide to the Marketplace. And I think some of the things we're going to talk about today are, are sort of jumping off points from, from that book, which we sur- sur- uh, highly recommend because it's a good book for people interested in learning about the high yield um, debt investing market. So today's conversation is going to be fun. We're going to educate ourselves uh, through your knowledge about high yield debt, and it should be good. It sounds great. One of the things that I noticed about your background um, that I thought was unique, and I just wanted to ask you this out of the gate, and it has nothing to do with high yield debt, is um, you're a managing partner at a private elementary school, I believe close to where you live and reside in New York. And I I don't know, I just, I thought that was interesting and I wanted to sort of uh, just hear a little bit more about how you got involved with that school. Sure. So uh, around the time of the great financial crisis, uh, my family and I started to get away uh, in, in the Hudson Valley on the weekends. And we fell in love with the people in this town called Garrison. Uh, it's just north of Westchester across the river from West Point. And uh, while we were here, a good friend had started a pre-K program uh, that was progressive. It was bilingual and the children were thriving. Um, our, chids, our kids did really well there. So um, it was a model for education that we didn't see exist anywhere close. And as I got more involved, I got interested in helping put up an elementary school version of it uh, to benefit our kids and and the kids of our friends. So uh, we bought this old mansion that was built in the 1800s. Uh, It was built by a West Point officer and we renovated it into a school. So it's a bit like the X-Men campus. We launched with 35 kids and um, over the years we expanded uh, today we're sold out. We have 165 children at the school and uh, the outcomes are terrific. Um, the kids are curious, they're engaged, uh, they have a good sense of values. We think they'll go off in the world and be positive change agents. So um, building a school was uh, not something I intended to do, but it's been immensely rewarding and I was glad I was able to help. It's a very neat story because I have a 13-year-old and also a 10-year-old and they're in public schools and they're in a good school system here in Connecticut. But 
I can certainly see how sort of education is, uh, could sort of set to be disrupted or if there are progressive programs out there that certain types of kids can thrive in that. So that's, so that's great for sure. Thank you. Okay. Let's get into high yields because that's why we have you on here. Um, how did you get, wh- how did you get started in high yield investing? What's the overall background, sort of like the story that got you into the space? Sure. Well, you know, it's not something I wanted to do when I was a kid, <laughs> nor was I, you know, we're at, nor was I the guy pouring over 10 Ks with a headlamp on the bus in the morning. Uh, that was milking. But it's interesting. I, I wanted to be uh, in the music business in college. I had worked at record labels. I, I did a summer internship at MTV. Uh, I got to go to the music awards and go backstage. I mean, I had some really good experiences. But my junior year, I studied abroad in London, and I got an internship at an investment bank. Uh, and that brought me into the world of Wall Street. Um, the people I worked with were, were brilliant. They were working boardrooms. It was very impressive. And I worked so hard, I wanted to be just like them. So after graduating, I got accepted into the analyst program at JP Morgan. And uh, they slotted me into high yield. It wasn't something I chose. It was a decision made for me. But the decision to stay was in large part driven by the mentors I found along the way. So I had people at Goldman Sachs and Apollo uh, who really taught me the field and kept me interested. And as I learned more, um, you know, I decided to make a career out of it. Can you help us understand um, sort of the overview of the high yield market here in the U.S.? I mean, how big it is, how many different issuers are out there? Is it public and private companies? I mean, what's the landscape look like? Sure. I mean, the landscape has changed a lot. When I started my career in 1999, high yield was roughly 350 billion in size. With the growth in PE buyout funds um, and passive investing, the market has expanded nearly eightfold. Today, it's close to $3 trillion. And um, what's interesting about the growth is the number of issuers today is roughly 3,400 issuers in a $3 trillion market. Back when it was 350 billion in size, um, the number of issuers were roughly 1,700. So you've had this like tremendous growth in the market, but it's largely been driven by bigger, larger issues. Where back then it used to be a you know a bond market was a 200 million dollar average issue size. Today it's 800 million, and it sort of plays to you know how we think about the market a little bit. But um, yeah, it's private, it's public. There's um, there's loans, there's bonds, and there's just a lot of different ways. Uh, people can get exposure today. Can you talk a little bit about the origin of the high yield market? Like before I did research for this, I I really knew nothing about it. And I I thought I'd heard a story about Michael Milken being involved in some way, but I didn't really know what happened. Can you sort of talk about the origin of the market? Sure. It's a, it's a good question. I think origin questions are always pretty tough, but um, as we, as we think about it, um, the modern high yield market really started in the 1970s um, amidst a stagflationary backdrop. There were many high quality um, credits. They, they were investment grade issuers and they faced uh, demand and cost challenges no different than uh, what we're seeing today. And as their prospects diminished, um, the risk of default on, the, on that debt increased and it was getting downgraded. Um, it lacked a natural buyer base. There were banks that um, held the risk. There were insurance companies and neither really had a um, pocket for um, this, this, um, you know, more problematic debt. And so a- around that time, there were some scrappy investment banks that, um, found a buyer base for this debt and they started to trade it at deep discounts. And the uh, returns from those early vintages were very good, such that it attracted, uh, new buyers into the space. And the demand became so significant that it actually opened up primary market for high yield. So initially it was all just kind of fallen angels, secondary trading. And then the seminal moment was in 1977 when Drexel um, brought a a bond to the market for a company called Texas International. And that was really the first primary issuance in the high yield market. And it was led by Michael Milken. And then from there, um, in the 1980s, you had, you know, very aggressive leverage buyouts in the early 90s. You had a spectacular bust. Um, Paul Volcker around that time was very critical of high yield. He called it junk bonds. He tried to get the f- the Fed to curb um, the issuance of high yield. He really got that involved with the market, and so the the market had to change. And I so I think when you look at the origins of high yield market, there are the early days, 
And then there's the mar the market that we see today, which really emerged in the early 1990s after um, some of the missteps and the market became uh, more institutionalized and uh, credit docs became more standardized. And that's how the whole industry became unlocked and started to grow in a healthy way. Yeah. Was Volcker actually responsible for the term junk bonds or is that, did that come from somewhere else? I think it came from somewhere else when we were writing the book. Uh, we were trying to pin it down, uh, <laughs> but I don't think it was Volcker. He was just um, very unhappy with the, the concept of a leverage buyout where you can lever the target's balance sheet to buy it. it just didn't seem right to him. And thinking about firms that access the high yield market, how, how do they think about their capital structure and sort of the balancing between equity and debt? Before the advent of high yield, uh, most companies raised, they had a barbell approach. They raised inexpensive bank debt um, from commercial banks, uh, which was very well covered and low leverage. And then they had to fill up the rest of the capital structure with equity, which had um, higher return expectations. And um, so what happened with high yield is it provided a middle um, solution. So instead of, um, it was more expensive than bank debt, more risky, and it was um, uh, less expensive than equity. And, uh, and, and so it slotted in the middle and the ability to kind of parse out the risk uh, opened up a, a real um, financing market. But when you think about like, you know, how do companies think about their capital structure? Um, it's really no different than how you might think about financing a home. Um, you can you can put equity down, you can get debt, and a lot of it is based on um, the price of the debt, uh, the quantum you can get. Um, and so you're balancing those trade-offs with how much interest expense you're willing to support. Um, so it's the, these are the considerations and there's no right answer. Um, every buyer comes out um, on a different, you know, in a different place and they might do so with the same exact company. In the book, you talk about the different types of high yield debt. You talk about bonds versus leveraged loans and fixed rate versus floating rate debt. Can you just talk about what those are and sort of what percentage of the market they represent? So high yield today is a $2.8 trillion market and roughly 50% is high yield bonds and 50% um, is leveraged loans. So it's evenly split. A um, couple of key differences um, between uh, the two categories of high yield. So bonds have a fixed rate of interest. So they might cost an issuer 7% and, uh, and loans pay interest uh, today on a spread to SOFR. So <clears throat> if rates move up, um, you're very happy that you have a fixed rate obligation. And if they go down, you want a floating rate obligation. So it can be a positive or negative. Um, <clears throat> with respect to documents and credit documents, um, loans tend to be more restrictive. They have more restrictive covenants that limit what the issuer can do. So you can get potentially lower cost financing with more handcuffs and bonds tend to have a lot of flexibility. Um, so if you're, you know, a capital intensive company and you, or a company that plans to be acquisitive and you need real flexibility to grow um, with your existing capital structure, bonds can make sense. The real trade-off with bonds versus loans though is um, the call protection. And what call protection essentially does is um, creates duration. So if you're a bond investor, um, you don't necessarily want to get repaid right away. Um, so uh, you have uh, penalties, essentially. And if you want to redeem the bonds in the first couple of years, it's very, very expensive for an issuer. Um, leverage loans don't have much in the way of penalties, um, similar to your mortgage, that you can kind of repay it at a small premium or at par. So a company that has a lot of free cash flow that intends to deleverage, um, a lot of leverage buyouts, for example, they they will want to have some leverage loans, some prepayable debt so they can uh, chip away at the burden and lower the interest. Um, so, and, and so I think the combination of these two, the combination of the, the rate hedge uh, between having some, it's like, it, it's, it's why a lot of companies choose to have both um, leverage loans and bonds in their capital structure. Looking at the buyer side of this versus the issuer side, like who are the major buyers of high yield debt? Well, the answer differs based on whether you're talking about the bond market or the loan market. Um, this in part has to do with regulatory considerations. Uh, bonds are securities and leverage loans are not. Um, as securities, they're govern governed by the 1940 Investment Act. And what the 1940 Act 
says is that um, the bonds must settle in T plus three. So a lot of funds that are more focused on um, liquidity, um, you know, need to transact in securities for regulatory purposes, for reg cap, um, really can get exposure to the bond market efficiently and leveraged loans are not suitable. So in terms of the buyer base specifically, um, roughly 60% of the high yield bond market is held by pension funds, um, high yield mutual funds or income funds. And, um, and then on top of that, you've got about 15% that are hedge funds. So that's about 75%. And then insurance companies might be 12%. So you get close to 85, 90% um, just amongst those different groups. Um, and it gives you a sense of, of where it's parked. Um, pension funds tend to be stable money, um, but some of the other accounts, they, they're open-ended. So you can see how the asset class can be volatile because money can move in and out of those situations, those funds pretty quickly. In the loan market, as I mentioned, they're not securities and they can often take a long time to settle. You can sell a loan. Um, you might get your money back in two weeks. It might take you six months. It's uh, it's kind of a wild market when it comes to settlement. I mean, we we settle loans sometimes with fax machines and you know, it's like <laughs> dealing with back offices. So because it's less liquid and it's not a security, it doesn't fit neatly into public market funds or mutual funds. If, if you're a mutual fund today and an investor wants their capital back, you have to give it back in three days. But if it takes you two weeks to get the money back from a loan, you can never run at 100% exposure. And, and you have this kind of bank run issue because there's an asset liability mismatch. So the buyers of the loan market have um, are different. And uh, the primary buyer of loans today are actually CLOs, which are securitized vehicles. And that's roughly 70% of the buyer base for loans. So the, the CLOs will buy a large pool of loans and then they will parse up a risk in their structure so that like if they own $100 million of loans, maybe the first 50 million will be sold as an investment grade tranche to insurance companies and it keeps on getting parsed up and the last 10% is sold as equity to a CLO investor, which is essentially like 10 to one levered equity. Um, so there isn't actually with the CLO an opportunity to get pure unlevered loan exposure. You're buying into a structured vehicle um, away from the CLOs, maybe, you know, 12% are hedge funds and hedge funds are um, kind of in and out. Um, so if you want leveraged loan exposure, hedge funds, good way to get it. Um, and outside of that, I mentioned loan mutual funds aren't a good option, even though there are some out there. So for folks that are looking at leveraged loans, which we think are really attractive today, um, your best option is really to set up a separately managed account with the with the large investor. Yeah, I don't, I don't think there's too many areas of the market where fax machines are still <laughs> utilized. So uh, that, that's definitely interesting. Uh, we had to find actually, them on eBay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, when, we, when we've had people on the podcast who, who have communicated with Warren Buffett, like he, he's even behind that. Like when you communicate with Warren Buffett, it's all done in the mail. So, uh, you know, he, he doesn't uh, he doesn't even have the fax machine. I don't think so. Uh, um, I want to ask you about some of the terms before we dig into the market a little bit more that, that you use in the book that people might not totally understand. Um, and the first of these ideas of ranking and subordination, can you explain what those are? Some of this is complex um, with respect to these two ideas, but but to keep it simple, um, ranking is just another term for, for seniority. Um, so it, if you're higher ranked, it means you have better credit protections, you're going to get repaid ahead of another claim. It's just simply a, a pecking order question. Subordination is a more complex topic because there's lots of different types of subordination. Um, there's lean, there's payment, there's structural. And really what it's all getting at is there's a debt claim that's subordinate to a more senior claim. And in by being subor ex expressly subordinated, um, you're contractually agreeing um, in, a, in a stricter sense to have your um, your claim subordinated in recovery. So if you're in a bankruptcy situation, um, the more senior claims uh, really have a strong argument to um, get a recovery before the junior claims or the subordinate claims can get anything. Um, and so it, it's the designation that I think makes the downside recoveries different for the stack. And so is the idea the lower I am down there, the more I'm gonna want in terms of an interest rate to compensate me for that? Hundred percent. Okay. Um, and and how about this idea of covenants? Can you explain? I mean, people probably have a general idea what covenants are, but can you explain why they're so important? Covenants uh, outline the obligations an issuer 
must uh, agree to to live by. So um, some examples are, um, you know, a covenant that says you can only raise so much more additional debt. Or if you sell assets, you need to buy assets or repay the debt. Um, you can't take dividends unless you've um, improved your credit profile. So there, there are these covenants that you know are called negative covenants that protect, that prohibit the company from from doing something unless certain criteria is met. And then there are um, covenants called affirmative covenants, which um, are more obligations for the company to do something. So. Uh, you need to publish your financials within 90 days or um, disclose any uh, material events uh, that that might change the picture. Um, so it's more disclosure, it's obligations, uh, and, uh, and it's really to you know, make sure that the company is doing what it's supposed to do. So, I mean, the, the reasons why this is important are obvious. I mean, you want to prevent the issuer from uh, doing anything harmful uh, to your credit position. And... Um, with some of the affirmative covenants, it actually really helps with liquidity because if there's more um, information in the market around a company, it really helps um, develop a buyer base to the extent you know it, to the extent that um, you want to get out and other people need information. Having that information out there is very helpful. And so, with the, if you're in violation of a covenant, and this might change with different types of covenants, I mean, is that technically like being defaulted on defaulted on the debt? Yeah, and there's different types of defaults, and there are cure periods. Um, but uh, yeah, you you can essentially be in default on your debt. If you so so the idea would be if somebody did that, you probably would be some sort of negotiation process with a lender where you would sort of try to figure it out one way or another. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's okay. also it just depends on the nature of the default. Um, you know how how serious it is, but um, the most significant is really um, payment default when interest is due and you can't make payment, that usually precipitates something more serious. Can you talk a little about credit ratings? You know, we'll see on CNBC different, you know, AAA and, and all kinds of different credit ratings. But can you just talk about like sort of what the range of credit ratings are and where that line is, where you cross from, you know, investment grade to high yield? The credit rating designation is purely arbitrary. And I, I actually don't even know why the rating agencies came up with the dividing line where, where they did. We tried to do some research on that. And we couldn't get a good answer. But um, the short of it is that um, Moody's and S and P um, have a dividing line, and for Moody's, it's uh, B double A three. So anything higher than that is investment grade. Anything lower than that, so B double A one, is the starting point for high yield. And anything lower than that is obviously high yield. And then for Moody's, uh, for S and P, excuse me, it's triple B minus um, is the marker. And um, yeah, so that's that's primarily the difference between um, you know the ratings between the two. How big is the investment grade market relative to the high yield? I assume it's it's probably bigger, but I, I don't know for sure. Like, how, how much bigger is it? Uh, it's much bigger. So investment grade today is roughly an eight trillion dollar market, and high yield bonds. Um, if you're just comparing true fixed income, it's uh, one and a half trillion. So it's roughly six times larger. Um, but if you include leverage loans, it's roughly three times larger. And are there certain there are certain types of institutions that can't hold high yield debt? Like I know it's a big deal when someone goes from investment grade to high yield. Is that because there are certain places that no can no longer hold the debt? Sure. I mean, I think what you see with debt that is about to get downgraded from investment grade to high oh. yield, um, it usually sell, tends to sell off in advance of the downgrade, like maybe six months prior. And I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that you have insurance companies that own the debt. Um, and the reg cap associated with the position as investment grade for high yield is very different. So it doesn't make sense for them to own it, or there could be investment grade type income funds uh, that don't have a bucket for it. So you do start to see uh, the debt trade off ahead of the ratings event. And sometimes the ratings event actually creates um, a bit of a price recovery because when it gets downgraded into high yield, there are also high yield funds that then need exposure, right? And if you're an ETF or you're an income fund or something along those lines, um, and now you have a big, large liquid issue in the high yield market, um, there's a bit of a bit for that. What does the industry breakdown of the high yield market look like? I mean, if, if I looked at the industry breakdown of the S&P 500, and then I looked at sort of the industry breakdown of companies that issue high yield debt, I mean, do they look fairly similar? Or are there certain industries that are overrepresented in the high yield side? I'd have to do the comparison against the S&P. I don't have that off uh, the top of my head, but 
what I can tell you about the industry breakdown for high yield is that um, if you look at it, you know, over you know the last twenty years, it's actually pretty consistent. I mean, energy, media, telecom, healthcare, it's roughly 35% of the market. Maybe it's 34% today. It might've been 37% long-term average. So it really is a slice of um, US kind of small cap GDP type exposure. And, um, you know, it, it, it's uh, fairly diversified. Um, there are periods of time where one industry blows out, like in the early 2000s, tech and telecom was a very big portion of high yield. I think it might have been as much as 20%. In 15, energy was a much bigger weighting um, before the sell-off in late 15, early 16. So um, you do have these moments where an industry kind of gets bigger, but for the most part, it's been pretty consistent. One of the things you'll see a lot of times when we get towards crisis times is people will start talking about high yield spreads. <laughs> um, can you just talk about in general, like what high yield spreads generally look like during normal times and then kind of what happens to them when we get into these crisis periods? So, I mean, this is the most topical question I think we get with, with allocators today. And it's, it's an interesting question just because we're in a unique environment. So um, to put it in context, today spreads on loans and bonds are roughly 550 basis points. When we talk about spreads for, for loans, that's generally looking at a three-month SOFR, which is just under 5%. And for bonds, it's the um, five-year treasury, which is around 3.7%. So when you add um, 550 basis points on um, on SOFR, I mean, it's uh, the interest rate that you're actually getting from the asset class is close to 10.5%, which is very, very rare for loans um, to have that type of absolute return. And then for, um, you know, for bonds, it's roughly just over 8%. When you look at ranges, uh, the tights, um, in really kind of robust environments where people are feeling good about the economic outlook and credit risk is low. Um, spreads have gotten as tight as 220 to 250 over. So 550 compared to that is significant. But uh, in recessions, uh, it can blow out to 1,000. It can blow out to even more for, for moments in time. I mean, in the great financial crisis, I think it got close to 2,000 for some period of time now. After that, it, you know, you had in a uh, period of time where you could, you know, at 100% returns uh, type potential. So, you know, these moments aren't necessarily um, long lived. Um, and some of it is less about credit risk and more just about liquidity in the system. So it's, um, so it's an interesting dynamic. And I think the real question today is, I mean, are spreads fairly compensating for the risk in the economic outlook? And if you look at spreads at 550, it's easy to conclude that it's not um, in a recessionary environment. Things can blow out a lot wider than this, but we've never had a recession where risk-free rates were this high. When you've had those thousand basis point spreads, risk-free rates have been in the, you know, one, one percent, one and a half percent. Um, so if you're getting three, 400 basis points more compensation on the risk-free rate, um, the picture from a yield standpoint is much different because you're getting, you know, um, close to, you know, nine, 10% absolute returns where you were getting five, six percent before. So, you know, what what we question is whether the right way to look at spreads is actually taking something, you know, in addition to the 550 to account for the fact that the risk free rate is so much higher than it's been in past periods. And and um and that's the tension, I think, when people look at high yield today is is it cheap or is it not cheap? And from an absolute re return standpoint, it's cheap. But from a spread standpoint, it's not. If you look historically at, at times where spreads have blown out, I mean, has that been a good entry point, like for long-term investors it, to enter the high yield market? Yeah, or generally. Does it depend on each situation? Yeah, it sort of depends on the situation. Um, you know, like there have been periods of time where there's just been a lot of toxicity in high yield and spreads have blown out um, in anticipation of a default cycle and recoveries. And it was, in fact, the case that, you know, the carnage in the system was so bad that it was going to inflict a lot of losses. I think the difference today is that the credit, the system is quite healthy um, from a fundamental standpoint. And we've just had the ultimate cleansing event, which was COVID. Um, Post-COVID in 20, if you were a weak high yield issuer, you, had, you were restructured. So um, the system itself, uh, 
eradicated a lot of the really weak hands over the course of that year and emerged much healthier. Post, Post-COVID, we were in a 1% default rate environment. And if you look at some of the forecasts from Wall Street deaths, uh, it's showing uh, defaults going up to kind of three and a half percent, which is the long-term average in high yield. So it's, um, yeah, I think spreads are kind of, um, you know, you have to really look at it in the context of where is the system. And I think, uh, you know, today the system is quite healthy, which is another uh, factor to consider when you think about fair value spreads. This might be outside of your area of expertise, but do, do widening spreads tell you anything about the equity market? So for instance, if, if spreads are blowing out, like, does that tell you trouble might be ahead in the equity market? You know, people always, there's this saying that people always say like the bond market is smarter than the stock market. Like, is there anything in that? Yeah, I don't know about yeah. being smarter. Um, I tend to think the bond market is really backwards looking and the, you know, the equity market tends to be overly forward looking. But, um, but I th- do think it's instructive because if you just take a step back on some of the data we talked about, the, um, you know, high yield is a slice of, of overall GDP. There's 3,400 companies that are reporting information and there's a market that's voting on the risk and the return and the price of the market, the spreads all reflect, you know, what people think is uh, the outlook. And if spreads are at 550 basis points over, um, what the market is signaling is that the amount of credit concern um, is not significant. And, uh, it's signaling that corporate balance sheets are quite healthy going into this soft patch. So I think it's um, it's suggesting that you know the you know the corporate um, you know the Russell 2000 domestically oriented type issuers um, are going to be okay. I think that's what the high yield market is signaling. You had a really cool chart in the book where you kind of looked at the high yield re- the return of high yield over the long term from both an absolute return and a risk adjusted basis, and then compared it to some other types of asset classes. I'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit about the return of high yield long term and how it compares to things like, you know, maybe investment grade or equities or, or things like that. Yeah, it's a good question. So um, we have 31 years of data and we only know this because we did research for the book on, you know, all these types of questions. And uh, over that time period, high yield bonds have produced a 7.2 percent annualized returns. Um, government debt was 4.4 percent. And IG was five and a half percent. So from that standpoint, uh, it uh, you know you get a sense that it, high yield has outperformed government debt in IG, um, and then loans uh, are lower. They've been at four point seven percent, which on the surface doesn't feel like there's enough compensation um, to take loan risk versus IG or Treasury, but. The more fascinating data point around leveraged loans is that in 31 years of data, there have only been two negative total return years. Um, And that was in 2008 and 2020. In most years, the interest income from leveraged loans offsets the price volatility. Um, And it's remarkable that in 29 out of 31 years, loans have posted positive total returns. So from a sharp standpoint, um, it's off the charts um, versus the other fixed income asset classes. Loans have a a 1.2 sharp ratio. And if you look at the performance of high yield debt by credit rating, how does that look? I mean, when you go to the bottom and you get the highest yielding stuff, does that actually have the best return long-term? No. Long-term, uh, I think the, uh, you know, the, the picture for um, like triple C's, for example, um, would suggest that it doesn't uh, justify um, reaching out on, on the risk spectrum. But I think, I think it's, you'd have to be careful about looking back and, and then projecting forward with that information because the higher quality high yield segments like double B, for example, um, have higher duration than the lower rated segments, you know, maybe by a year or so. So with longer duration debt in a declining rate environment, it's had a real tailwind um, to outperform kind of lower rated debt. I mean, duration's been a friend. And I think as we look forward, Duration is not necessarily the friend, and the triple C segment of the market has sold off really hard. I mean, today the prices are in the seventies. The unlevered yields are kind of fifteen to twenty percent unlevered, and so, um, so I think you know, looking back, you certainly have a data point that suggests reaching for that type of risk wasn't necessarily compensated well 
But looking forward um, and then looking at periods where we've come out of sell-offs, uh, you know, like 16, 17, um, coming out of COVID, um, coming out of the GFC, like there, there's, there are moments in time where triple C's can, you know, be, you know, 100 to 200%, you know, type returns relative to the uh, one, one to two X, the returns of, of the higher quality segments. So it's, uh, so, you know, you have to really think about like where you are in the cycle as you, as you make that. That's interesting that the higher rate of debt has longer duration. Is that just because higher quality companies are allowed to issue for a longer duration? Yeah, I, I think it's, um, you know, it's a really good question and I'm not entirely sure of the answer, but it, it does seem to be the case because coming into 2022, um, IG debt, um, had the longest duration that it's ever had in history. So there was appetite for higher quality, um, risk. Um, and I think the mindset coming out of COVID was I'm okay, not getting paid. I just really don't want to take credit risks. So, so folks were, had an appetite for, um, higher quality. And then in order to get the yield, I, I guess what that suggested was they had to go out on duration to, to get kind of the yields that made sense for them. So it, it did create a bid for, um, longer duration debt. And I think the triple B it certainly was in the triple B category and extended into the double B category, but it didn't necessarily benefit the B and the triple C issuers. It seemed like if I was an asset allocator or family office, and I was looking at of the two asset or the two types of um, investments we're talking about, high yield or leveraged loans. And I was looking to further diversify my portfolio into something that has a better risk adjusted return. It seems like that leveraged loan basket would be very attractive because we've had a lot of people on the podcast that talk about building these like all weather types of strategies that can withstand a lot of different market environments. And the fact that, you know, over 31 years, there's only been two down years that has a sharp of 1.2 is is pretty amazing. And it feels like that would be a very good addition to a multi-asset sort of all weather mm -hmm. approach. Yeah, for sure. I think there's a lot of reasons to to make the argument um, for leverage loans today. I mean, le loans tend to be more senior in the capital structure. They tend to be um, the first in line to get repaid. Um, they have the floating rate protection. They they tend to have better credit docs. And I think yeah, the the loan market has had more technical dislocation than the bond market. Um, the CLOs that um, I talked about being the 70% buyer of loans, they're rating sensitive vehicles. The way their securitizations work is they can only have so much debt that's triple C and, and keep it at par or have hold to maturity type accounting. And when those buckets get filled up, um, you know, you have to start more you know, mark to marketing that. And if you take the um, lower collateral value, it could potentially cut off distributions to certain classes in the securitization and create all sorts of problems. So that dynamic has forced a lot of CLOs to get ahead of the downgrade cycle and just sell out a risk unnaturally. It's not, so, I mean, it's selling based on liquidity in a lot of situations um, because of the rating sensitivity. And the agencies have been so aggressive in downgrading right now um, that it's created this acute problem in the loan market that doesn't necessarily exist in the bond market because the bond market is less rating sensitive. And where this shows up um, are in returns by ratings category. So if you buy triple C loans, for example, um, you can get close to a 20% unlevered yield today. And if you buy triple C bonds, you can get close to, you know, 16%. So you're getting, you know, four or 500 basis points excess compensation, in our opinion, because of this technical dynamic with CLOs. So I think the entry is interesting. Um, the floating rate component with SOFR where it is, the fact that you can get our portfolio of loans, for example, has a 13% cash on cash return with 20 points of upside. It's very rare that we see something like that. Can I ask a question around maturity? So... I guess in both of these markets, they're, the maturities are like, w w what would you say on average in terms of number of years? Um, I would say, you know, Bs and triple Cs are kind of around like three, three and a half and double Bs around four, four and a half. And does, I'm just thinking like, if rates stay higher for longer and these companies that borrowed at 
low rates in the past have to refinance this debt at higher rates. I mean, that could be sort of an issue headwind for some of these companies where maybe the business of cash flow isn't, they're not high, high quality businesses. I mean, some of, most of them probably aren't high, high quality because that's because where they are. But I mean, I'm just thinking like higher interest expense, lower profit potentially if they have to refinance at higher levels. Yeah, it's a very big issue. I think where we're seeing this real time are um, in the 2021 buyouts. And there was so much inflation in purchase price multiples and you know PE was paying very big prices because they were getting very cheap borrowings. And you know a company that financed their capital structure with loans and it was paying 50 million of interest is now paying 100 million of interest and they're not hedged. It's just a completely different underwrite. And, and what do you do? Um, on the good news standpoint, um, the maturities in the system have been pushed out. So this is not like, you know, 07, 08, where you had this incredible maturity wall and the capital markets were shut and there was no solution, but, you know, and it was going to precipitate a nasty restructuring kind of default cycle. Um, this time around, we have some time. Um, so, it, but in the next kind of year or two, if rates don't come down, it's going to be very problematic for uh, these refinancings and it's going to be even more problematic for private equity because they're not going to be able to get the exit multiples that they underwrote. What's your feeling on the rating agencies? You know, the Silicon Valley Bank thing, uh, you know, some of these rating agencies are kind of getting called out. Because, I mean, that happened so fast, but they're sort of looking at that and what the rating agencies might have missed. I mean, obviously during the financial crisis, that was like kind of a train wreck when it comes to the rating agencies and you know what they mm -hmm. so i'm just generally speaking what's your what's your take on rating agencies good or bad pro or con yeah i would say in the past you know you could definitely have made the argument that the rating agencies were slow to pick up on situations or re react to the downgrade cycle that was underway but um i think following covid um, things change. I, I, I thought in 2020, the rating agencies moved very fast. I mean, there was a point in time, I think, where downgrades were outpacing upgrades by you know, three to one, four to one. And I think they started to look more at market data and see that, you know, prices were coming off on these situations. And that was a cue to get more dialed in. Um, I would say the same is kind of true in today's environment, where it's less about kind of negative surprises and hey we missed something like silicon valley we don't i don't have a lot of examples of that in high yield today at least um but it's more just getting in front of it i think if there's a criticism from my standpoint is probably on the flip of it is that it's really sticky on the down and companies that are doing well and growing um are going to have a lot of difficulty getting the rating agencies to um, move up because what's the upside right it's easier to be conservative. So, you know, for, for some people, that's a real opportunity because the company that's doing well, but might not getting the rating upgrade will still have a yield commensurate to that rating category. And, um, and there's more potential for, for kind of misrating on the upside today, which is another way of thinking about it. Let's flesh that out a little bit. Do you actually use that as part of your process when you're looking at an individual issuer? I mean, talk us through how you go about analyzing these. Before we jumped on, you were like, you know, you spend all your time reading 10, 10Ks and 10Qs. So you're obviously knee deep in this stuff. So what do you look at specifically? Well, I don't really, I don't really think much of ratings in my underwrite um, of a company. I think we just do our own work versus read the S&P note. But um, but where ratings do play, uh, a role is kind of in the sourcing and the technical. So for example, we're, we're heavily focused on the leverage long market opportunity that we talked about. And the way we can win on ratings is, um, I mentioned that the average size of the high yield issue has gone from 200, um, million to 800 million over the last kind of 20, 25 years. So a lot of attention, um, from the agencies are on those bigger issues because that's where the activity is. And if you have these smaller issues that are three or four hundred million dollars and they've been downgraded and it's not well known um, and the CLOs have to just get out of it, 
uh, it can sort of trade um, poorly for a while. And if you do your work around those situations um, and you find that actually it's a decent company, it's gotten past its controversy, there was a transitory issue, um, it, may not get a uh, it may not get a rating upgrade until the debt's refinanced or the company's sold. Um, so you do have this period of time to, to get involved with it where the natural buyers are boxed out because of the rating. And you're saying, I think, you know, the rating is actually the opportunity because this credit is much better than the designation. So we look for that. I think, you know, with everything you do, I mean, you might like a company, somebody hates it. It's there's, there's a fundamental view on situations. And if you're looking at private opportunities, which is where we spend our time, you have slightly better possibility of formulating a due diligence point of view that might be different or give you some sort of edge. But the other source of alpha is sourcing, right? And if you want to source uh, opportunistically and use that as a, uh, an alpha lever, um, you have to find situations where there are unnatural holders um, that are looking for liquidity. And, um, and so we find in our whole business model is centered around these, these smaller issues that are you know, three, four, five hundred million dollars that don't have a natural home with either the large alt managers or the ETF and passive funds. It's just not in their purview. And, uh, and, and they're not well known if they're private, they, they were syndicated to 20 groups at issue. And when something goes wrong, all those 20 groups are kind of full on exposure and, and who, where's the risk transfer in the bond market, there's much more efficient risk transfer and people can get up to speed easily on bonds, but in the low market, it's very, very hard. So you have to do something different to obviously put up differentiated returns, but I think we've shown that this model of kind of focusing on smaller cap high yield issues that have more uh, potential for price dislocation is a, a really good source of alpha. Our funds have um, produced almost 700 basis points uh, of alpha um, a year since we started the fund 10 years ago. It sort of reminds me, I'm going to go off sort of the reservation here just for a second, but I want to, I'm interested in your comments on this. We uh, one of the models that we run is based on some academic work that looks at highly levered small cap value stocks. Mm -hmm. And then it looks at a series of factors that um, uh, tries to predict whether or not the company can pay down that leverage and take that bank bankruptcy risk off. And in the back test of this academic research, I think what, they, what the authors were trying to do is they were trying to replicate private equity returns in the small cap value. Um, high highly leveraged universe. Mm -hmm. um, so it, I'm, I'm curious on like the debt pay down thing. Is that part of like your thought process? Yeah, 100%. I think it's, um, you know, it's really like I'm focused on stress situations. You, know, you, you don't buy debt in the 70s or 80s if everything is rosy. Um, there's usually some setback. And really what you're betting on is that this company can grow past that um, generate free cash flow and pay down debt unless they have really attractive growth opportunities where the return is well in excess of um, the benefits of repaying that debt. So I, I'm not sure our experience would conclude that it was the PE returns were entirely driven by the deleverage on an absolute basis. Um, I really think it's more about, um, you know, the deleverage plus the opportunities to invest in growth. You had mentioned um, sort of ETFs and that I have sort of two questions uh, relating to this. So how do you view, I mean, you can, you can approach this type of investing in two ways. You can go, you know, specialize, trying to find an edge, which I think is what your firm does, or you, there's obviously the index-based approach to investing. Um, you know, you're looking to drive long-term market up performance over the major index. But obviously, an index of these is just looking to track the broader index. So, I mean, how, I guess, um, do you think that an index-based approach for many investors is okay? Or are there mm -hmm. flaws? Because, you know, if you look at like passive investing in equities, obviously, there's pluses and minuses of that. Um, versus active management. Um, so I'm just wondering mm -hmm. how, you, you know, you, you view that. So a couple levels. So the ETFs, 
underperform the indices by 100, 150 basis points pretty consistently. Um, so there's, there's definitely some friction there, but it's not to say it's the worst place to get exposure because you can, you know, give money to an actively managed mutual fund and um, over time it's produced maybe 80 basis points of excess return a year. So there's some excess return, but there are a lot of different funds and you have to get the right one. So I think if, for me, if I had to choose between the two, I would consider the ETF. But for the fact that there's a lot of um, closed end funds in high yield that are trading at a discount to their nav. So if I was an individual investor, I think that could be an interesting way of getting exposure because you, you, know, you have two ways to win. But it really is, um, I think it's a directional bet on the asset class when you're investing in structures that have 1,200. I mean, the ETF has 1,200 high yield issues in it, an actively managed fund. The larger ones have 600 high yield issues. There's, there's only so much alpha you can generate when you're that diversified. And being in a 40X structure um, forces you to have a fair amount of diversity. So that their, their hands are sort of tied in terms of what they can do uh, to produce real results. I mean, for us to produce real results, we have to run a concentrated book, you know, 20, 25 best ideas. And some of our bigger, our better ideas were really sized up. I'm just curious, why does the ETF underperform the index? Is that a transaction cost thing? Well, I think it's transaction cost. I think... Um, there are segments of the market that they're underweighted in as well. Um, for example, like in the bond market, 10%, 15% of the market are triple C's. There, there are a bunch of single D's. And some of the higher returning securities in the index may not be of size, of, you know, where they can actually transact and source and look, you know, um, efficiently to, you know, um, with the inflows and outflows of their capital, right? They need to be kind of in, larger, more liquid situation. So uh, I think fees are one part of it, but I think the weighting versus the index is another contributing factor. Rajay, this has been great. Um, you know, this is certainly an area that I think, um, you know, Jack and I have learned a lot about today and, and we appreciate you sharing, you know, your expertise and, and taking your time to, to speak with us. Um, we like to ask all of our guests one standard closing question. You can go anywhere you want with it. You can stay within the high yield leverage loan market, or if you want to give more general advice, um, but based on your experience in the markets, if you could impart one piece of wisdom or teach one lesson to your average investor, what would that be? It would be to be confident, but don't be so confident where you can't pivot. I mean, some of the places I worked at in the past, you know, the most brilliant traders, they could be long an idea and the facts change and they can be short an idea. I mean, that type of flexible thinking isn't very impressive um, to not be so wedded to a situation. I think um, when emotions get involved and you get so deeply rooted in a position, that's usually when you start to make mistakes. Great. If people want to learn more about you and your firm um, and follow your research, where can they go to learn more? Uh, we have a website, um, www.wasserco.com. And we're on LinkedIn. Um, just reach out. We'd be happy to talk. Great. Thank you very much for joining us. All right. Thanks, Justin. Thanks, Jack. Thank you. This is Justin again. Thanks so much for tuning into this episode of Excess Returns. You can follow Jack on Twitter at, at practicalquant and follow me on Twitter at, at JJ Carboneau. If you found this discussion interesting and valuable, please subscribe in either iTunes or on YouTube or leave a review or a comment. We appreciate it. Justin Carboneau and Jack Forehand are principals at Validia Capital Management. The opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Validia Capital. No information on this podcast should be construed as investment advice. Securities discussed in the podcast may be holdings of clients of Validia Capital.